and, and if you're having trouble, uh, you, you can also, I mean, in general, uh, I might encourage you to partner up or team up to work on this because you can discuss what you're seeing. Um, so no big worries if you can't, um, just talk to the person next to you. Let's just try to learn 
when possible, because learning is just a good thing. So then there's another entire class of approaches um, that really highlight this very key idea of optimism under uncertainty. This is how most of us live life. Um, so, <laughs> and, and now I, I will I tell you, it is provably a good thing to do. <laughs> Um, and so the key idea here is that if you have some measure of uncertainty about what you expect to get, um, then take some upper confidence down, right? Don't assume the max possible, perhaps. But just, you know, presume that, you know, if you go, just go for the mean value, right? If the mean has some variance, then go for the thing that, uh, you know, might be a good idea. And how does this play out? Well, initially when you don't have a lot of data about a situation, you might, your, your confidence bars are going to be large, right? And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm giving you the main ideas, and then we can start playing. Um, the confidence bounds are going to be large. And then as we get more information, the confidence bounds are going to shrink, right? Um, so if we have something that looks like, like this, um, and another approach that looks like this, right? So this is action one, and here's action two, and we're looking at what rewards we might get. Well, this one has a, perhaps a higher average, but this one has maybe a higher upper bound, right? And what's going to happen when we try action two? One of two things. Either we will be proven right, right? Our optimism was justified, and we will get large amounts of reward, and we will be happy, right? So that's one scenario. Or we will be proven wrong, and this confidence bound will shrink. Because as we get more data, our confidence interval shrinks. So we will have learned something that will cause us not to make that mistake. So that, that's the notion of, like, that's the intuition why this concept of optimism under uncertainty works, right? Because either you're doing well and you win, or you quickly rule out an alternative so that you may win in the future. Right? And so it's not learning for the sake of learning, it's learning for the sake of trying to optimize for the future as quickly as possible. So there's a number of algorithms. This is a very key principle in reinforcement learning um, that use this idea. So I'll just give you a couple names. So there's this uh, there interval exploration, um, upper confidence, bound, or tree. Right, so again, you can even just see from the title, get a sense of what they're doing, right? What they're trying to do is keep some sort of bounds or intervals and using that to guide their exploration. Um, and then, so these are model three. Um, and then there's some model-based approaches um, called EQT and RMAX. And so the way these approaches work is if you're trying to think of the value, we keep bounds on the value, right? Um, the way these approaches work is that they say we're going to build a model, right? And there's going to be mo parts of the model that we know well, right? So this, this place, we have tried our transitions often enough that we know what's going on. Um, and maybe there's another part of the model space that we just don't really know, right? Because we haven't really tried it very often. And what we're going to do is assign the unknown Again, a really high value. So the EQ algorithm um, just says that I want to go to the unknown space, right? It, it, it describes it explicitly. That was one of the first polynomial time learning algorithms for reinforcement learning. Um, uh, and RMAX says that actually instead of having to distinguish between known and unknown states, any place that's unknown, just assume that it has given a maximum value of reward, right? So then you try to race there really fast because you think it's going to give you the maximum reward. And again, either you're proven right and then you're happy, or you're proven wrong, but you'll learn something quickly. Because if you have that maximum reward sitting there, you're going to shoot there really fast, right? As opposed to something about like, oh, let's just kind of slosh around, maybe we'll try exploring it here, maybe, maybe it's like slightly better, and then you don't really have the incentive to explore, right? But when you think something is awesome, you try to get there super fast, right? Again, that's the intuition behind these algorithms. 
And what we're going to play around with uh, in, on a small scale in this tutorial thing um, is just thinking about even how you initialize your Q function and how does that affect how you learn, right? Because we talked about on Wednesday the initialization of the Q function doesn't actually matter, right? That it will still converge over long enough time. But it may converge faster or differently depending on how it's initialized, right? Because you could imagine how optimism might play out. Any questions? So this is just a very quick overview of exploration strategies. There's a lot of research um, in this area. I, I feel like uh, with these sort of approaches, these entropy reduction approaches are used when it's too hard to uh, do something more intelligent. Well, okay, this is your simplest strategy. This is when things are kind of hard, but you try to quantify at least how well you're learning your model. Um, and I would say that essentially all of the very successful uh, and, and certainly the ones, all the ones with proofs that I know about that have bounds on them use this notion, again, of optimism in one way or another. One question, what, what's, been, what if these uncertain states are unknown states are already dangerous for you? And you still ah, think okay, so good question. So all of this was using the assumption that you don't have kind of catastrophic errors, mm. right? Um, so then there's another area of reinforcement learning, of safe reinforcement learning, where um, essentially you have to kind of fence in various ways. Um, so what they will do is they'll say that, um, or, or you have to assume either that somebody has fenced the bad area so that you know that you cannot go somewhere. And if you know that you cannot go somewhere, then you can try to bound the risk, right, that you'll end up there. Um, or that somehow it's not a cliff, but it's something a little bit shallower. So that perhaps you start out with, um, you know, you know that this region is safe, and then this other region you're not sure about. And then maybe you limit your exploration to doing something like this first. And then you go a little bit farther out. So there's approaches that do something like that. But all the approaches that I know of require some sort of that assumption. Because mm -hmm. if, if some bogey can stop out at any moment, then you're kind of screwed. Right? Okay, again, that's what I'm then you can't because really do anything. You cannot say, I want to know how it feels because it's so unknown and then you die. And then <laughs> Right, right. So, so again, you have to have some sort of something put in there to say that um, either here's a safe zone and you need to be very careful when you exit the safe zone and don't go too far, um, or um, something from the beginning that at least tells you that this is a bad reward. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a cool strategy. It's a very good question. I think this is also why you see reinforcement learning applied a lot to games and other such scenarios. But really go <laughs> cool. All right. Um, so hopefully people have been successful in getting the two vials. No. Yes. Some. How many people have? Uh, some people are. I put it on a USB. There's no Wi-Fi in this part here. <laughs> uh, um, I put it on a USB stick. Oh, okay, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. If a couple of people have USB sticks to, to pass around, that would be good. Yeah, only, only a couple. Right. <laughs> by these hashtags and so uh, O is for origin, C 
star is for goal, dot is for somewhere in between, and the hashtag is your ball. Right, again, this is super simple um, and, and quick. Um, and so there's some test mazes. Um, and then an X is a pitfall, right? So if you want to have like a, a hole or, or something that the, the agent can escape from, but you can give a different reward. Um, so then there's some functions, and here's a policy. So right now it's set to be an epsilon greedy policy. You guys in your version will fill in the update Q function, so I won't spend time there. Um, so the task name, so in this section, is where you can give it the name of either something that I've already created for you, or you can create a new one, right? Um, and then important parameter here is the action error probability. So this is a property of the world. So this is a probability that if you try to go north, so there's four actions, north, south, east, west. If you try to go north, maybe you end up going east or west. And so the slosh is always at 90 degrees, just so you understand what the action error probability does. So the, with probability, in this case, point 0.1, you're going to end up going either 90 degrees to the left or 90 degrees to the right of where you were trying to go, get to, right? So whatever straight was the direction. And then um, the pit reward is the reward associated or the penalty associated with that X. Right. And the other ones I, I've already put in here, you can obviously, you can change anything here, this is such a small piece of code. Um, but you have, a, so the, the goal for now is always set to 50, the move is set to negative 1, a hit wall is negative 1. Um, again, you, you guys can play around with changing these, the, the values that are set there are set there as, the things that I'm not giving you control over are just set to reasonable values, so you can play around with the other things and explore. Then over here, in terms of algorithm parameters, Alpha is the learning rate for so your Q learning or your SARSA that you're going to code up. Epsilon is for your epsilon greedy, right? So this is a probability that you take some random action. Um, here's gamma, that's your discount factor that you can play around with. Um, you don't need to change these unless you um, want to for whatever reason. Um, and then uh, here I'm initializing the Q table to zero, but this might also be something you want to play with. And so here's the main loop. Um, where for, so we're doing a certain number of repetitions of a certain number of episodes. So just to make that clear, an episode is one play of the game, right? So the first time you play the game, you might do really poorly in the maze. But the second time, and the third time, and the fifth time, and the hundredth time, you have, hopefully you've learned the maze, right? So that's the episode, like play the maze, play the maze again. So if, there's, if it's set to 150, you're going to play the maze 150 <coughs> times. Now, we are careful machine learning people, and we like to know about variance, right? Um, so if you just have this agent do it 150 times once, that's not really much in terms of data, right, in terms of knowing overall what the learning process looks like. So the number of repetitions just gives, uh, is the number of times that you do 150 episodes, right? So then you start a new agent from scratch, and you have it play 150 games. You, you start a new agent from scratch, you have it try 150 games. Right, so that's the key parameter there. Um, now all this stuff, if you have any questions as you go, just ask. Um, and then there's just some loops here. And uh, so you just pick, uh, uh, you, you advance the state by performing the action. Um, you get the next action um, given your current state. You update your table. Um, you, uh, and this is just uh, bookkeeping. Um, and importantly, the task is set to stop only when you reach the goal, right? And this is something you might also want to think about or play around with. The, the task does not end until you win. And so initially, you might be spending a lot more time trying to win, um, and hopefully later on, it takes less time. And right now, the, the reward is essentially a proxy for length, right? Because every time you move, you get a negative one, right? So it, it's essentially counting how long it's going to take you to get to the end. And then there's the body question. So let me um, just run this on a very simple example. So the, the first example is kind of this really silly maze, but I just want to show you what, it, what running this file turns out. So the black are the walls. Um, and remember this maze, this was the origin and this was the goal. And this is showing the value. So it, it, it has some high value here. The goal, because you always disappear as soon as you hit the goal, it ends up with zero value, right? 
because you never update that thing in the in the kind of loop that I set up. Um, so if that bothers you, you can change that. It just wasn't just didn't get to cleaning up that little tiny piece of code. Anyway. Um, but what you see here um, is also on top are the actions. So again, this is kind of trivial. If the goal is up here, and the, uh, uh, sorry, if the origin is here, the goal is here, you want to go down, right? But you see the arrows showing you where you went. Um, and then on the other side, you see um, now over each, you see the repetitions over each episode, right? So over here um, are the number of times you played the game. And this is the reward that you got. So you see some of the time they start low, right? And what does that mean? That means that the agent just went back and forth, right? A bunch before it actually came here, right? Because it did it and had no idea what to do. But then very quickly, again, because this is a trivial problem, you see everything kind of shoot up to be really high. Um, actually, one question for everyone. Why are the rewards still like 45 or less in this problem? Even uh, even at when it seems like things have converged, because of the ten percent of uh, going the other way. Exactly. So that because uh, there's an action error probability and also there's an epsilon reading, right? So sometimes uh, it we choose to go in a random direction anyway, right? And that's something to think about. So right now, in, in terms of how it's coded up, there's no tempering in the learning rate. That's something you guys can play around with. Should play around with. And there's also no tempering in the epsilon greedy. So even as you play a bunch of episodes, you're still doing some epsilon greedy, right? And you can debate whether that's a good thing once you figure things out. Maybe it's time to stop taking random action. All right. So um, what I've set up here um, is a set of things to get you started, right? And so you don't, you definitely don't need to do these in order. And if you start getting excited about something else, you can play around with it, right? Like this is really kind of your time to get a hands-on feel of how some of these reinforcement learning parameters behave in a very, very simple setting. Um, but hope the ideas or the insights you gain will be generalizable because these are key questions that come up in all of our um, So exploration one is trying out there's a short and a long hallway, play around with how, uh, how long it takes to learn, um, and what different Q-table initializations can do. Can you screw it up? Can you make it take really long to learn, for example, with a bad initialization? Can you speed it up by having a different initialization? Right. So that might be something fun to play with. Um, then there's a test maze. Um, and so test maze is the one where you can really play around with all the different factors, learning rates and all of that. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to see different effects depending on how you set those. Um, and then uh, there's exploration three is um, playing with the simple grid. That's the one with the pitfall. And looking at what happens as you increase that pit reward and see how the policy changes. So you might see some unexpected behavior and being able to explain that. Um, and this kind of goes to the safety question of like, you could, sometimes our agents will do weird things, which make, are actually perfectly sensible. but. Um, it, after the fact, that it may not be as expected. Um, and then exploration four is with the cliff problem. And in the cliff problem, you're going to be looking at, in particular, it's going to highlight the differences between on and off policy learning. And, and then here, you can, this, this is kind of, if you want to muck around, the, the internal is going to go high. But I would start, pick out one of these um, with someone next to you and start playing with them. And I'll come around um, and uh, Actually, you know what? Uh, let's all start with exploration one. And then we'll regroup after a few minutes, talk about it, and then after that, we'll make it into a few problems. So let's all do exploration one just so we kind of, everyone code, understands the code. Because uh, the first thing that all of you will have to do is code up your SARS and your Q learning. So why don't you do that first? So code up your SARS and your Q learning, try exploration one. We'll regroup, and then it'll be a few problems. Cool. Go ahead. Any questions? Also, just raise your hand and come on. I'm not sure if you have a great idea to
Right. So to so remember the conditions that we had written down on Wednesday um, for alpha. So it, now if I have alpha t as the learning rate at time at, at iteration t, we want the sum of these to be infinite. Again, if we want theoretical guarantees, if you're just interested in practicality, all bets are off, right? All, all sorts of heuristics, fine. Um, so what we want here is we want an infinite uh, value for this because what that tells us is that if we started our Q function in a really bad place, we could still get to where we need to be, right? So this is the infinite travel criteria. Yeah, this is just straight up from optimization. Um, and then we want the squares to be finite. That means, and that's saying at some point we want to stop moving. And so, what does a large alpha mean? Also, just intuitively. Well, if we look at this, another way to write down what's going on here is to say that if alpha, so uh, if remember uh, again on Wednesday, we wrote this down as 1 minus alpha kind of q old plus alpha, um, I guess, q empirical, which was r plus gamma q, uh, right? Yeah, being a little uh, quick with the notation, with the point being that alpha is trading off between how much you keep the old value and how much you replace it with a new value. Right? So early on, if you set your Q values arbitrarily, right, they're crap, right? They're, there's no information in them. You might as well replace them with something based on data. As you start to learn more, Again, okay, this is the intuition. These are the criteria. You already have that. Um, but the intuition, as you start to learn more, why don't you always want to replace with the data? Well, this is this has some stochasticity, right? Because this reward that you get at any particular time, well, maybe you end up getting a low reward for taking a particular action, and it was a great action. It was the right action to take, but you know, because of that action error probability, you just happen to fall off the cliff or whatever, right? Um, and so you can end up with randomness or noise in this update because, again, it's a, it's a stochastic update. And that's why you want to decrease it at the end. You want to then start getting rid of that randomness. So that's, again, the intuition of what's going on. So theoretically, if, if the wall was deterministic, and yeah. whenever uh, I have the action error, right. I would <coughs> choose the highest alpha I could. Right? Because yeah. then I, I, at every step, <coughs> every action I take, I, I know for, for a fact that this, this is, is the happens. reward that I get, and I'm just going to, and, and then yes. So if it's deterministic, <coughs> um, so that's, yeah, that would be some standard dynamic programming for value duration. Um, any other things that people want to talk about, ask about? What do you think is from the digital cube? Great. Um, so have people played around with it? Or have you been playing around with it? We're trying to. You have it. Oh, okay, yeah. Has anyone played around with changing the initialization of things? So uh, actually, I'll leave, um, I'll leave that question. <laughs> um, so, so let's see the, the question on the initializing Q and the question on on versus off policy um, for the next time. And so that might be something for you all to play around with as you're, as you're exploring. And as was mentioned, um, and maybe this is now something that you can just put into the code, um, changing, like reducing the learning rate over time um, will probably just give you smoother curves. And you may also want to think about similarly, do you want to reduce the epsilon on the epsilon rate? Because you may not want to change it to always do crazy things. But first play with the on versus off policy, and then reduce the epsilon. Any questions?
what to do, even though the agent has, should find it out by itself. Um, so what is the trade-off? Right, right, so, so I, that's a great question. And this afternoon, again, I'll give a brief overview of many, many areas of reinforcement learning. And one of them is uh, there's an entire field of imitation and apprenticeship learning, where you do try to show the agent in various ways, or try to create an agent that's aware of its uncertainty, so when it's not sure, about something it has for help. So then it doesn't necessarily just need to do what you tell it to do or just do it by itself, but it's trying to find the middle ground between sometimes you've done something by itself and sometimes it's yeah. yeah, do you know 
there is an example in this grid world where, where we wouldn't know the, the answer, or is it too simple? Because I'm curious if there is something I'm trying to figure out. Oh, I see. Amazing. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess this one, I would have, I mean, everyone here is pretty smart, right? So maybe this was obvious that this would happen. But th I think this is an example of how something slightly counterintuitive happened. Um, that you wouldn't necessarily expect, like, oh, the best thing is to bang your head against the wall because at some point you'll slip sideways. Right. Like, well, um, so now let's try out the cliff um, example. So that one is also kind of interesting. And just for sake of illustration, I'm going to set the cliff to pull it to large, large cliff of large. So here we have um, some action error probability to this is learning key learning, um, and it decides to do the same thing. It decides to go around, right? Which makes sense. So now let's change the action error probability and make it small. Let's just set it to zero so um, you never fall off, right? Um, and now again, it does kind of what we expect, right? It says that. Well, now that we know that we can fall off the cliff, let's just go straight across, right? So that also seems like, again, what you would expect to do if you were sure that you would never fall off the cliff. So could I, uh, yeah. the uh, topmost uh, row, yep. second from the left, we have uh, an L going down, right? <coughs> Is that because presumably the agent never got there? Yeah, I think that you end up, again, I haven't, I, I don't, I haven't run these things kind of long enough to make sure that so you kind of just get there, so it's yeah, it does, yeah, there, so there's definitely going to be non, I think that was pointed out, yeah, um, <laughs> that, that you pointed out, that sometimes you end up with some nonsensical regions because it just never gets there or fully explores them. <coughs> so now I, uh, I change this uh, to be learning to star stuff. Um, <coughs> um, and let's see what happens. And so now I didn't change the action. Uh, sorry, I didn't change anything about the model. I just keep doing to start Um But what Sarsa was saying is that you know you really you should still go around. Right. Um, and so. This is this difference between on and off policy learning. So Q learning is thinking about, is trying to evaluate what the optimal function would be, right? It doesn't matter what your exploration policy is. It says that you're exploring around, but I'm just going to consider what's the best thing that can happen. And so it says that, hey, even if, because remember I said epsilon to 0.5, right? So 0.5 of the time you're doing a random action when we're learning this. So if you're point five of the time, if you're doing something utterly crazy, well, Farsa says that that doesn't know how to distinguish that point five from the action error probability because it's on policy, right? It's considering the next action you'll take, and if you're doing crazy stuff, then this next action reflects the crazy stuff that you're doing. And so Sarsa learns the safe route, even if there's no action error probability because the agent is doing crazy things. And it just assumes that the agent will continue to do crazy things. Um, versus Q-learning said that actually this arrow point in the opposite direction, it said that, okay, you're doing crazy things now, but you know if you, if you decided to do non-crazy things, here's the optimal route. So here's where you see key difference between on and off policy learning. <coughs> because we're running out of time, I'll just give you the SARSA punchline. So the one way you can alleviate this and what people do is they gradually reduce the epsilon. So initially you want a lot of exploration, but it, over time maybe you want less and less exploration. Um, and then SARSA will learn this one if there's no action uh, error probability. And what I mentioned next time, um, very briefly, and I mentioned <coughs> previously, is that the reason why people like SARSA compared to Q-learning, because you might ask, you know, just why not always use Q-learning, is that in this simple world, <coughs> Q-learning does do better, often, most of the time. But it's a very, very simple problem. 
And usually we have to do some sort of function approximation and some sort of state aggregation to actually solve a real problem. And as soon as we start doing that, SARSA, um, under a variety of conditions, is still um, you know, they're provably consistent and stable in terms of its learning. And there are situations in which Q learning can get thrown off. Because if you can imagine now if you're doing some approximations here, this max might not be accurate. Um, and then you can get odd things happening. Right? So that's why people often go with SARSA with a decaying rate. So I think that's about time. Um, but if there are questions that have come up from here, uh, I'll start by answering them at the beginning of the next session.